So good afternoon. We hadn't met before this afternoon, uh, but we've had a very productive sort of hour and a half um, getting to know each other and, and talking with, uh, with other Googlers. But my guess is that most of you won't yet have read Catherine's book. So I wonder if you could start off just by telling us a bit about the book itself and I guess what, uh, what made you write it in the first place. Um, with, with pleasure. And I hate to sort of start by contradicting you. <laughs> But of course, we haven't met in, in person, person, but we know each other online. And um, one, of the, one of the things that's been interesting is we've been having ongoing discussions about gender equality and the difficulties of reaching it online. And the reason I wrote this book was because I couldn't, I went out looking for a book that would tell me the things that are in this book and I couldn't find it. So I wanted to find a book that would tell me um, where the debate was now, um, that would possibly explain to me what the different waves of feminism were, um, but much more importantly would explain how it was that here we were at this, in this century, in this year, and that there is still nowhere in the world that's gender equal. And what were the mechanisms that were holding women back? And I went to look for a book that had all of that, and I couldn't find it. So I started thinking that maybe I'd better write it. Um, there's another twist to that story that I may get to later. But then there's a, there was another missing element that I didn't realize until I was already writing the book. And this was in um, May 2016, the political party that I founded, the Women's Equality Party, ran its first ever elections uh, for the London Assembly, for the Welsh Assembly and for the Scottish Parliament. And when I was out canvassing on the doorstep, I discovered that perhaps one of the reasons that we had not made faster progress to gender equality was because people didn't know what it looked like or what it would be like. No, there was nowhere in the world you could point and say, this is, this is you know, of course we want to be in this society because this is what a lovely place it is. And in fact, people had uh, ideas about it that were all about repression. They were all about a place that would enforce some kind of gender neutrality rather than diversity and that would censor and ban. And, and I thought, no, no, that's not what we're working for. And then there were also questions about um, would a gender equal world be more equal in other ways? Would a gender equal world just simply replicate the world that we have now but have some women with big shoulder pads who were just taking the place the of the men in the... Eponymous 50 foot women. Yeah, well, <laughs> possibly. So, um, so again, I felt that needed to be in some way described and I realised I had a really clear idea of what I thought a gender equal world would be but maybe I'd better try and find a way of telling people. So in this book I not only lay bare the mechanisms that hold women back, but I then take you on a tour of a, of a gender equal world that I call equalia, though yesterday I was interviewed on the BBC and the interviewer told me that it was equalia and that that was BBC pronunciation <laughs> and who am I to gainsay the BBC? <laughs> well, it's nice that they've considered it. Yes. <laughs> so you sort of dropped in there um, the, the political party that I founded. Now, I'm sure most of us have founded political parties. Any? <laughs> no? No? Um, you describe how you accidentally founded a political yes. party. Do you want to tell us that story? Well, it's not dissimilar to why I wrote the book. I have a habit, if I can't find something I want, of creating it instead. So, um, in 2015, I went, there's a fantastic festival, I don't know if any of you know it, called the Women of the World Festival, WOW, at the South Bank Centre. Mm -hmm. And I went to that festival and there was an event about women in politics and it was involving three fantastic M female MPs from the, the three biggest old parties, uh, or at the time biggest old parties, the Conservatives, Labour and the Lib Dems. And I was listening to women talking in the cafe before that event and they were all saying that they were so disillusioned with the political parties that they weren't going to vote at all. And the idea of women 
not voting when we are not even yet at the 100 year celebration of the partial enfranchisement of women was one I found deeply distressing. But it also made me think about how very depressed I was with mainstream politics as somebody who has both as a journalist covered politics for the best part of 30 years, but also been politically active and engaged. And yet I didn't feel any of those parties were speaking to me and I felt, thought that they were all talking about gender equality but not delivering it. And so at this meeting, when, when the Q&A opened up, um, uh, I, I got to my feet and I said to the politicians on stage how much more excited we would all be if, the, if one of them or all of them were the leaders of their parties and the room sort of erupted. And, um, and I said, but you know, you're not, and maybe we need to think about ways to create change within politics. And, may, and I'd been watching UKIP, um, and it was really clear to me that the main parties, in seeing UKIP gaining popularity, instead of challenging its positions, were trying to make themselves more like UKIP. So I said, what about if we do the same thing for gender equality? What if, what if we found a women's equality party and we prove that gender equality is a vote winner? will those big parties start trying to make themselves more in that image? Um, and I said, anyway, if anyone wants to dis discuss it, I'll be in the bar, which got taken to be an invitation to everyone to join me at the bar, um, which could have been really expensive. <laughs> and indeed, um, given what's happened to my life since, since was very expensive, um, because also then by the time I got home, social media had decided not that I was saying might it be an idea? <laughs> um, might it be an idea to um, found a party? But um, saying I was going to found a party, and then the final bit to this story is that I rang. Um, uh, m many of you may know who Sandy Toxvig is. Um, she's a, a fantastic sort of journalist, presenter, comedian, writer. She can do everything. She's also a really good cook and baker, and it's amazing. Um, but she and I had been on the founding committee of, of the WOW Festival and we had been talking um, for, for a while about how frustrated we were at the slow progress towards gender equality. So I rang her up and said, uh, this thing's happened and people think I'm starting this party. And instead of saying, um, you know, oh, that's interesting, she said, but that's my idea. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, at the end of WOW, um, every year she does something called mirth control which is a sort of fantastic finale. And she was intending to showcase a women's party and a sort of women's government. And she said, darling, would you like to be foreign secretary? Um, so that, that sort of set us off on this, on this very interesting um, experiment to see whether you can start a party that would do this. And the answer appears to be yes because we now have 65,000 members and registered supporters and more than 70 branches across the UK. Fantastic, and I have to say I'm a member myself, which is how all, all of this today came about. Um, so you mentioned n there being a, a lack of a vision for what a gender equal yes. world would be, and also that when you spoke, uh, spoke with people before the sort of proposition of, of the Women's Equality Party that um, current political parties weren't, weren't doing politics in a way that engaged. Yeah. Do you get the feeling there was a vision for what more engaging politics would look like at all? And does that um, slightly leading question as well, you, you mentioned that you were taking some ideas for UKIP, but I know personally that I don't think the Women's Equality Party really works in the same way as UKIP. <laughs> other than the idea of taking votes? Well, there, well there, there is, a, I hope, another parallel with UKIP, which is whatever you think of them, they have proved that a party with almost, with extremely small amounts of elected representation can create seismic political change. Mm -hmm. Now, I observed that before the Brexit referendum, but at their peak, they have never had more than two MPs, and yet they have changed the course of this country totally. Um, so I'm saying we can do this in a benign way. Um, in that sense, we can be like UKIP, not in any other sense that I can think of. Um, but um, 
I would say, well, there is one other way uh, in which they may have at times been better, and that is in actually understanding who their voters were and talking to their voters and engaging on grassroots level. Um, because one of the things about mainstream politics, and it's interesting sitting in Google's headquarters and talking about this, but the digital revolution has had a very interesting effect on mainstream politics, which is quite a lot of people have retreated um, into a sphere where they don't actually go out and talk that much, where they, they sort of substitute the digital interaction for the, for the real interaction. But that's part of a much bigger process that's going on. And I don't actually want to entirely blame the mainstream parties for what's happening because there, there are also part of the digital revolution is a, is a loss of trust in public institutions, public bodies, um, a, a kind of rapid cycling of so many things that are going on. And it's creating crises and it's creating turbulence. But one of the things I guess that happened with us is that we saw in that turbulence a possibility of beneficial change mm -hmm. as well as the dangers that you see around you. And so we, we sort of leapt into, into the space that that was creating that wasn't there before. And there's something else I'd say, which is the political system in this country is a very, very bad one in terms of letting in newcomers, um, in terms of preserving things that are dead and should have been cleared away. So that's another reason the mainstream parties have got the way they are. They're protected but also damaged by a system that allows them to assume that they own votes rather than having to go out and earn them and that allows them to resist change and is also incredibly good at keeping out women in ways that I try and explain in the book mm -hmm. and that were in some ways revelatory for me even though I'd covered politics for 30 years, I had no idea how bloody expensive it was until we started doing it and, and how that works and how that keeps out women. That's a really, you know, there's a lot I've learned in these, in these years. So I think we understand that the Women's Equality Party is not going to be like other parties. Um, we've, we've said that we wish to disband. Um, which most political parties aren't, aren't ready to disband as soon as the job's done. Uh, are there any other ways where you think that the Women's Equality Party is really um, showing a way forward that other political parties could take on? I would hope so. I mean, being collaborative, I, I think everybody is really sick of the politics that you see that, 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 PMQ, that Prime Minister's Question Time at Westminster sort of typifies, which is that sort of punch up that you have. And I was actually watching, watching it today and you know, there wasn't one moment where the Prime Minister or the leader of the opposition actually engaged and debated what they did was they tried to score points off each other and it is really clear that the that one of the reasons people were being turned off by politics and not voting is because for women um, but for a lot of, of people in general they cannot see themselves in this kind of shouty you have to be exactly like this form of politics and they want something more pra pragmatic more collaborative something that gets things done they understand that um, it's very hard to find something where you're going to agree with every single opinion of a party that particularly one of the ones that is trying to legislate for absolutely everything in the world but that shouldn't be a reason therefore to dismiss the good things that are happening so people want to find ways of looking at the good things and moving them forward and the old parties and the old system um, entirely mitigates against that so things I mean practical things we did we started by saying we are collaborative we open our membership to members of other parties um, which no other party does um, we also said we are not left or right we are a non-partisan political party the fight for gender equality which is very often thought to be a preserve of the left is too precious to be allowed ownership of a part of the spectrum that is not doing enough to move it on and anyway there are vast areas of common ground that we can identify that don't fall onto that left-right spectrum and um, we also uh, invited the other parties 
either to work with us or to steal our policies. And you know, one of the very first things we did is we started kind of going, look, here's a bright, shiny policy. Please come and take it. Um, so I don't think people do that. Um, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point over at this woman sitting here who, um, Hadler Gunnarsdottir is our head of policy and partnerships. And as you might guess from the name, Icelandic and was part of the Icelandic government that in 2008 came, came in after the 2008 crash and um, sort of did amazing things. And we have been learning from Hadler's experience, but we've also together been finding ways of doing things really differently. So we have got a way of selecting our steering committee, for example, that no other party does. Um, we do some traditional things. We vote in some of the members through our party conference. We appoint some of the members, but we also have a complete random draw of the membership. And she got to ring up people and go, hello, you have been selected to sit on our steering committee. And apparently a couple of them were, were de declined that opportunity, but everybody else very eagerly joined. And it's a very, it's an interesting way of making politics more porous, you know, of bringing people in. All of the candidates we've run have been people who have never stood before and probably would never have got through the, they would have got through selection processes at the end of them because they were incredibly able candidates, but they would not have been able to go through the processes that you need to go in order to reach those committees, which involve a lot of time serving. And for women, and, and often women um, with other, you know, women so often have caring duties one way or the other, and um, for them it would have been an impossibility. So, and so another thing that we're doing is we raise bursaries for candidates who can't afford to run, and we raise um, money for childcare costs for candidates. I think one of the wonderful things we've seen since the Women's March in January is in the US, huge numbers of women who would never have thought of standing for office now enrolling with the various organisations which can support them in, in a different way. Um, but I've certainly found that very, very exciting. I know it's one of the really funny things. It's like, I don't want to sound like I'm grateful to Donald Trump for anything. <laughs> Um, and I really don't think we should be, but he, the, the, um, that election did something important, which was when we first started the party, the thing that we most frequently heard is, um, surely a party like yours isn't necessary. Sure, surely you already have gender equality. I mean, you've got the Equal Pay Act. What more do you want? And. Um, as soon as Donald Trump was elected, we had people coming up to us in the street going, how fast can you fix things? You know, <laughs> So I think you know, the spirit of the women's marches, um, that it, we are in a period of new energy and activism. And actually we're now rolling out, um, we call it the fifth wave, you know, we think there's a fifth wave of feminism that's starting. But we're going to be running activism camps for not just for members of the Women's Equality Party, but for anybody who wants to to learn what to do with all that energy. That, because that was the other question people coming up is like, this is terrible, but what do I do? And so now this is our answer is like, come and learn what you can do. So one of the things that I found um, sort of selfishly uh, pleasant in the book was in one of the chapters where you talk about difficult topics, pornography and prostitution. And you say you went into a meeting um, with strong views in one way and came out with lots of questions and thinking maybe that wasn't the right way yeah. or even that a different way was right. And me as a, as a novice feminist, I get confused a lot. Um, and my guess is that when a lot of this, these new activists come along, there will be uh, heated debates um, about all kinds of topics where you know, we may agree that something is wrong, but not agree on the best way forward. Have you learnt anything you can share about how that can be done most productively and, and what the dangers are? Um, I guess one of the most interesting things for me in in terms of trying to build a movement that was as broad and diverse and inclusive as possible 
was how easily um, even kind of ideas about inclusivity can prove anything but and they can actually start being things that people argue about and you you know it is a, a constant source of frustration to me how splintered the women's movement can become because divide and rule is a, is a very real thing and so what we're doing is is trying to do exactly the opposite and what I was trying to do with this book is there are there are some areas that are really difficult and I mean when I when I say I came out of that meeting with questions I'm still finding my way through some of these things and it's because I think 90% of what we need to do is really straightforward and really self-evident and the shocking thing about the lack of gender equality is that everybody knows that we need to do things everybody knows things like we need um, that diversity in businesses right the way through from the top to the bottom actually makes those businesses better everybody knows that increased female participation in the economy makes the economy more vibrant and therefore is good for everyone not just for women people know those things and yet they still don't do enough to get to them but there are a few issues that are much more complicated and where actually there isn't necessarily a clean and perfect solution and those tend to be ones where um, we can spend way too much energy fighting when actually there are I think ways of talking about it and ways of coming through it and that's one of the things I've tried to do to the book is I haven't shied away from any of the sort of most hotly contested areas of debate um, but I have admitted the areas where where I don't know or where it's been difficult for me in in an attempt to to try and move things on from you know uh, that that sort of thing that says this person has one opinion I don't agree with I agree with all of the rest of these opinions but because they hold that one opinion I'm going to stop I'm going to put them out of my life I, you know and that's that is something that happens too often um, and we need we to make this change we need as many people as possible on board for it and we need we need we you know I hate the phrase bigger picture but we in this case we really need to see the bigger picture right you mentioned uh, diversity in boards and women in business uh, in general one of the things that uh, hasn't been resolved for me uh, is I completely I think it's fairly straightforward to see how if you take a board that's got you know, 20 men and no women or you know, 18 men, two women, adding women to that mix is clearly going to help in terms of diversity of life experience and things. What's less clear to me is if you have a board that, I think there are probably remarkably few um, examples of this, but if you had a board that had 17 women and three men, is it that women are naturally better for boards. You, you mentioned sort of in the book uh, being less risk-taking, for example, in ways that would have discouraged the financial crisis, for example. In which case, you know, maybe a 20 women, no men board is, is for the best. Or is it actually the diversity that's the most important thing, which can, of course, be diversity of all, ma all manner of things? Um. So, you know, when you said as a novice feminist, you sometimes get yourself in trouble. <laughs> You're not in trouble, I promise you. Thank but you used the word naturally in there. And, and the word naturally is one of the, one of the concepts that is a, is a difficult one because we have no idea what men and women would be if we were freed from the constraints of the socialization of, of the upbringing that we have that tells us what gender roles are and tries to impose them in some cases. And so um, one of the things I also do in the book is I look at the science um, and um, I poke at these ideas. It was the person who, who um, said that if Lehman brothers had been Lehman sisters, it might not have collapsed, was Christine Lagarde, uh, the head of the IMF. Um, she did say she was joking when she said that, but there are a lot of people who think that um, women are more risk averse. And there is some research that suggests that, but whether women are naturally more risk averse or whether 
you know, as in whether this is a biological thing. That is a that is or a condition. that's a whole right. another <laughs> thing. Um, and actually, there there is um, research on this is moving all the time. But but what what remains absolutely stable to your point is that diversity is incredibly important, and diversity meaning not just people who look different or sound different, but bring different perspectives and make each other uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. What isn't good is people in a room who all feel so cozy with each other that they don't challenge each other, and they, then they get into dangers of groupthink, and that's where you see sort of the great corporate disasters, is you look and kind of go, how on earth did, did this decision ever get made? And the answer is that nobody spoke up because they were all used to, re to being nice to each other and reinforcing it. Um, but, I mean, to give you an example that's a sort of obvious gender one, um, in, in terms of then the absence of female representation at decision making in politics, the very famous thing about treating sanitary items as a luxury item, no room that had, an, had women in it or enough women in it would think that sanitary items could be classed as a luxury item. Um, and that's, that's again the kind of the dangers of decision making if you only have men around a table. She evokes the picture of Donald Trump signing uh, around women's health. Or indeed, um, yesterday there was a picture from Saudi Arabia of a new girls' council, um, and it was all men, um, right. uh, the girls' council. I'm sure I've seen similar equality commissions and things in, in the UK somewhere. Well, I joked on Twitter that I'm going to start a game show and it's going to be called Cherchez la Femme. <laughs> I think we should explore uh, where, where things can, can be better. Um, and this is where we may wish to bring in Hadler talking about Iceland. Um, rather than me give the background, why, why don't you give the background for what Iceland has done and where they are now? Well, the thing that's really interesting about Iceland is for seven years they've been top of the World Economic Forum's um, global rankings of, of gender equality. And it, it is in many ways a country that deserves that ranking. But again, it shows you how, f how far we still have to go if you realize that they still have a really big gender pay gap there. Um, I mean, Hadler can, can speak to these experiences with, with um, more authority. She can speak to most things with authority. One of the jokes I make in the book is Nordic women have missed the memo that tells them to soften the edges of their opinions. Um, <laughs> And um, it's, it, but it's one of the great things about so the Nordic countries are all ahead of the UK on gender equality. And one of the ways in which you notice it is that women find ways of talking that are not as apologetic as we are acculturated to be here. Um, so, you know, I, I for years worked in various management levels in, in journalism. And I would find myself kind of trying to let men in the room think that the opinion had come from them rather than me to get or the, the idea to get it through. And it's something you're actually sort of semi-trained to do, which in the end is unhelpful. And it's wonderfully bracing um, to be around women who speak their minds more directly. But um, one of the things that was most interesting to me, Hadler fixed up when I felt I had to go and spend time in Iceland for this book and Hadler fixed up for me basically to meet the whole of Iceland because she knows the whole of Iceland um, and, it, and when she hadn't fixed up for me to meet people I'd go in and they'd go do you know Hadler Gunners does it? <laughs> yeah. um, but um, what I hadn't realized I'd assumed I knew that they had had this famous um, women's day off in 1975 and 90% of Icelandic women um, took the day off from paid and unpaid work. And I had assumed that that had been the start of Ireland's, uh, Ireland, Iceland's journey to uh, gender equality because it had um, galvanized the women. It was only when I got there that I realized that it is a nation where the men are all on board with the project in a way that I really wish was true here. 
and you know, I was, I was, I'm afraid I was slightly whinging to John before um, I came in that I'm going around talking about my book at the moment, or I go around talking about the party, and we get these great crowds, but there, there are not enough men. I'm really pleased to see the men here, but the idea that we should be having these conversations as if these were women's issues rather than <coughs> things that affect all of us, men need to be in these conversations. And in Iceland, men are in these conversations. And so I, got, I came back really excited about the Women's Day Off. And I came running into the office and went, we have to do it here, we have to do it here. So we're um, working to organize a Women's Day Off in 2018, where we need 90%, we just need 90% of women in this country to um, stop work for all or part of the day. And you know, we're trying to work out how to do it. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, Hadler, I, it, when I talk about the gaps in in Iceland, you see those very clearly. But um, but I'm right, aren't I? That Iceland Icelandic men are sort of more with the program than men here. You've lived here long enough to to feel that. Yeah. Um, so um, yes. They are more on board. And I think there are conversations that I have here that I haven't had in Iceland for a long time. <laughs> uh, so it, it was almost like starting over again because I got involved with the Icelandic women's movement in the late 90s uh, and, and uh, early this century. Uh, and then, <laughs> then some of the conversations that I'm having here now are just exactly the same conversations uh, and even even from even from before that, so even from times that I didn't engage with this uh, conversation, was too young to do so. Um, and there are issues here that I feel Iceland and most of the Nordic countries have have solved a uh, very long time ago, and that includes like uh, childcare, uh, and I think um, and shared parental leave, uh, and these are probably the two policies uh, that the Women's Equality Party has that would that would significantly change the state of uh, play here in the UK. And almost overnight, uh, a, a, like a system of truly shared parental leave where, where there is a, a use it or lose it uh, a proportion for men, for fathers, uh, it, it changes everything overnight because that, that, that means that they, they start taking uh, the time off to be with their children. It means that employers know that uh, dads can disappear just as well as uh, moms. Uh, and even <laughs> they're even more of a risk because they can you know they can have kids until they're like 97. <laughs> there's there's a like certain time when when women don't have uh, don't have children anymore. And I get a lot of questions here uh, in the UK which are like like f often from women who say like but I'm I'm not planning on having children. What does this have to do with me? And my answer is everything because this impacts all women and uh, and of course all men as well. Uh, I mean. Uh, women in a, in a certain age probably know that that it it impacts the opportunities we have the the potential salaries that we may have and so on so it's it's this kind of understanding of of women's issues as not only something like what does this have to do with me as an individual but also a, a collective thing and I, fe I feel in Iceland that we've, we've we are in a different place uh, for that but of course as you say. Uh, it's no utopia, and none of the Nordic countries are utopia. Far from it. I mean, still, still high rates of gender-based violence, which I think is probably the uh, the most significant manifestation of, of women's inequality. Um, but there are some things that I think uh, can be learned from, and the Women's Day Off is one of them. So I hope all of you join us in in making that uh, happen. So I guess to to wrap two previous topics into one, you've said that you want more men to show up basically to, I mean, physically to, to events, yeah. but also in, in terms of uh, gender equality. Am I allowed to say I want every man to read that book as well? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> because, because a lot of men um, don't get why it has to do with them, that, that mm -hmm. point. And so one of the things I would really hope, and you know, this is a rare man, he's read my book, hurrah. Um, it is only it, out for a week, so yeah, that's yeah. fairly rare. <laughs> but well, so I said I, I might get to another story. So I, act I actually sort of wrote this book by accident as well, even though I was explaining I did it because it didn't exist. I had the last book that I wrote was bestseller. Um, and after 
when you have a bestseller, what happens is publishers come to you and say, what's your next book? And they were all trying to get me to write a book for them. And um, I said, I'd like to write a biography. And they were like really pleased because my last book had been a biography and that was a bestseller. And then I said, of Angela Merkel. And their faces fell. <laughs> it's like, she's boring. We're not interested in her. And um, Angela Merkel is most definitely not boring. Um, she is one of the most important political leaders of my lifetime. And at the point where I was proposing it, it would have been significantly ahead of this election where, of course, you know, who knows whether she's going to be in later this year or not. Um, and they, and when, and then eventually they were coming back to me and saying, well, because it's you, we'll make you an offer. But they were offering me really low money for it. And that is based, the, the money they offer is based on the expected sales. And the, I had bucked the trend because I had, as a woman, under a woman's name, unlike J.K. Rowling, I had written a book that sold really well to men, my last book. And I had, as a woman, written a biography of a man, as it happens, Prince Charles. But it, that book sold really well to men and was by a woman about men. That doesn't happen in publishing. And so the idea of a woman with a woman's, you know, not hidden by initials, not C. Mayer, but Catherine Mayer, writing a book about a woman, even though that woman was the most important political leader in Europe, um, was for the marketing departments who did the number crunching was bad. And that's because men do not buy books by women. And men are, this is again, this isn't when we talk about what's natural and isn't, you are, everything in society tells you that we're not worth listening to. And there are all sorts of famous statistics about, you know, if I've been talking a lot, admit, you know, hopefully because you want me to. Um, but, you know, if a woman talks a quarter of the amount of time of a man, it is perceived by the men to be already talking as much as the man. Mm -hmm. um, and in films, you know, there's all this stuff. I, I have the statistics in the book about films where, you know, in a crowd scene, in a typical film, it should be 50-50 in a real world split. And instead, only 17% of the crowds will be female. In cartoons, I mean, everybody tells you Frozen is this sort of wonderful feminist cartoon by Disneyland. And it has two princesses as, as the main characters, but they have only 43% of the dialogue. Um, and the men, the, the female characters have 43% of the dialogue, which is good by Disney standards because there's one that I don't know how to pronounce. I, told, I was told I was pronouncing it wrong the other day. Mulan, Mulan. Mulan. Uh, apparently the dragon talks more than the heroine, um, the male dragon, and, and the heroine speaks less than anyone else in the film. And that's, but that's, you know, so this isn't stuff this isn't stuff that's being done on purpose. This is all this kind of unconscious bias playing out, but it plays out in really profound ways. And so when I say, I really want men to read this book, or I really want men to come to meetings, I really want men to engage with the issues we're talking about because these are issues for you that directly concern you. And yet everything you're told is that it doesn't, that it's women's issues, we, you know, we, we put it in separate silos. So I kind of have a question for everyone in the room, really, which is how do you think we should get men on board? <laughs> Sorry, just a small question, and I know I'm supposed to be answering them. If you raise your hand, we can uh, bring a mic round. Yes, that was a real question. That wasn't hypothetical. Anyone? Change the name of the... Sorry. <laughs> I was just saying, just change the name of the, the theme itself, you know, because I think sometimes just the name itself kind of makes them feel like they are going for a specific, um, I mean, they, they're supporting that topic already, but maybe they just want to have like a general conversation, just want to know more. So maybe that would be it. it. It's half a comment and half a question. I was just really interested. I'm, I'm a marketer as well, so sorry. Sorry on behalf of my, my people. Um, <laughs> so it was uh, my question. You, you said that um, the marketing department were fretting because um, men don't buy women's books 
well, maybe they should be better marketers. And maybe that's the challenge we need to lay ourselves down a bit more is like, our job as a marketer, well, the way I've always interpreted my job as a marketer is to make sure that the audience access things that will interest them. And if I'm a marketer, then I'm simply not doing my job and that's simply not acceptable. So the marketers at those publishers should be thinking, how can I do this? Not, not this product is unmarketable, in my, in my opinion. I probably, I probably should defend marketing departments only in the sense that what, what, they're, do what they're doing is when they have a pit book pitch, they look at what they look at the sales figures. Has there been another book on this topic and how did it sell? And um, one of, you know, there are reasons I explain in the book for why people underestimate Angela Merkel and she's done it on purpose as well. She doesn't actually like you noticing how interesting she is. Um, but the overall trend of men thinking that things that are by women are not for them is, is a huge trend. And I think that there is definitely in marketing a tendency to say, well, this doesn't work. We already know this doesn't work, so we won't do it. So yes, I would hope that marketing departments would really start questioning rather than saying this is conventional wisdom, because conventional wisdom is usually not wisdom. Are these marketing departments usually populated by men or women, and does it matter? It can be both. Right. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you must not assume is that women are not um, inculcated with the same ideas. And, you know, we saw that in a very graphic way with the results of the US election, where um, although a majority of black women voted for Hillary Clinton, a majority of white women voted for Donald Trump. And, you know, uh, again, something I, I unpick in the book but yeah we 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 are we are the products of the same cultural soups it's soups sorry that's a strange way of putting it but you know what i mean so i think was there a yeah, quick um, there? something you mentioned like right now is that um the man i've been talking to when i went to say um evenings that had uh, women tech makers stuff like that uh, where like they w they didn't know if they were actually welcome there, or if when they came there, they would like women would look at them like, "Oh, you're an intruder. You you're not supposed to be part of this." So the invitations themselves, also something that you said, um, uh, that the title can be intimidating, and if there were special sessions that were named like for male allies, that they would feel more invited. So. Um, I don't really know how to solve this, but this is, has been an issue with the people I've talked to, why they don't go to these events. Thank you. And just to speak to that directly from personal experience, I joined the Women's Equality Party after reading an interview in The Guardian where it was made very, very, very clear that men were welcome and needed because equality is better for everyone, um, as, as our tagline goes. So yes, I think that does definitely have an impact. Uh, thank you. That's so interesting. And I'm um, sort of proudly married to a male feminist um, and we're raising two boys. And it was it's been a really interesting experience because even just things from reading like um, all the traditional storybooks, I hadn't noticed before that I'm reading to my two year old indoctrinating this sort of male dominated patriarchy, which I hope is a world that they won't grow up into. Um, and I've you know, intentionally my husband and I have gone out and sought almost like specialist storybooks that feature strong women characters in them to make sure that, um, you know, Rosie Revere, engineer, if anyone's interested in that, that um, range of books, that they're, they're very um, exciting, but they're not readily available. They're on special order and, <laughs> and all sorts of things. I guess um, for me, part of um, making women's equality more of a reality is in how I raise my children and finding those opportunities for to, to grow little boy feminists. Um, and it's not as easy as I thought it would be to find those opportunities. So I think making it making it clear and making a, a, a clear choice path for parents, I think, is an important part of that mission as well. I think um, one of the most interesting things when I was looking at the science of sex and gender is the research that shows how very early the me gendered messaging is going through the sort of pink and blue binary that you get 
so you get a lot of um, a lot of my friends said to me oh I didn't think that that um, boys and girls were necessarily that different and that it was all culturally imposed until I had my children and then the moment I had my children I realized oh no it's absolutely from the moment they're born and actually all the research shows you that from the moment they're born they are getting those messages so even people pick up girl babies more than they pick up boy babies and they treat them differently and they've done all these all sorts of very interesting experiments in dressing um, babies but in a colour that makes people think they're a you know, different sex and um, they've done uh, experiments with monkeys as well to try and find out what, what it would look like and then they realise that monkey communities actually pass on gendered roles too um, in, in interesting ways. So it's very, very hard to, to um, avoid that messaging even for people who are trying to bring up their kids as feminists. And, um, but you know, it making that effort already makes such a such a difference. And it is amazing when you go back to books, books and films that were sort of childhood favourites, and you haven't looked at them since you were a child. And then you look at them, and they're just like, they're they're they're, they're terrifying. They're they're kind of propaganda. And you know, it's amazing. And TV shows and films. And yeah all of culture. Yeah, which is, by the way, something I deal with in my, um, let me pronounce it in the BBC way, <laughs> equalia. Um, the, um, you know, one of my questions, you know, in terms of do we actually have to censor and get rid of this huge cultural heritage in order to keep, to create and maintain a gender equal world? And I think any society that starts destroying its cultural heritage is in fact veering into fascism so the answer is no but you can see all sorts of countries where they have found ways to contextualize what they have and to treat it differently so it 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 is it's a very real very real issue and it's a very real impediment and i mean you just pick up any newspaper any day and you look for the women in that newspaper and you will very often find an attractive woman on the front cover. I happened to see the Times on the way here today and there was a very nice picture of Angelina Jolie on the cover. Now she's doing something very important, but that's not why her picture is on the cover because it's a picture of her on a cover. It is not a big story about what she's doing or a headline about what she's doing, which is the way a men's issue would be treated, would be with the headline and the story and not much of a picture. Um, the other women that you will find in papers are very often victims rather than having agency of their own. So this, you know, everywhere you look, it's, it's really, really hard to find something where that isn't happening. And, um, you know, I'd, for parenting, I think it's, it is one of, one of the absolutely key issues, but dealable with. All of this is, we can, you know, we can do this. And just to reassure you that the, your experience of finding children's books is certainly not only yours. There was a video, I think Sophie may have tweeted it recently, um, of a mother and daughter at a, a bookstore. And they took the children's section and first removed all the books that didn't have any women in. And that was most of them. And then removed the ones where women only had you know, tiny or didn't say anything. And then the ones that uh, only served to be princesses or whatever and you know, it was it's just terrifying um, all of these things I think we're probably at, at a stage of opening it up for any other questions so um, shall I I will run the mic round that's fine thank you thank you so much um, I have a question imagine you are the CEO of Google how would you foster uh, gender equality in the world if you had all the resources if I, if I was the CEO of Google, how would I f foster it in the world or the country? Gender equality in the world. In the world. Um, I, would, I would probably um, do even more than Google is already doing to foster it in the company because starting at home is always a really good place. But I would also, you know, um, Google is a really interesting company in doing all of these huge, tra looking it for huge transformative technologies. And I know that um, I actually talk in the book to Sarah Hunter um, at Google X about the potential impact of the self-driving car. And there is a gendered impact of that. Um, 
it's quite difficult to tease out at this point, but it could be something that helps women in all sorts of ways. It might have um, ways of, of enhancing female security. It might help with women um, because of that unequal share of caring duties, etc. Um, but on the other hand, you might say that it would be better to share out the caring duties more rather than solving it. So that's, by the way, always a danger of technology is that technology will come at solving things rather than solving the root problem. It will say, OK, let's maintain this structural imbalance, but find a way to fix it in a different way. Um, but I would like I would like Google X. Um, in fact, they can take me on to. Um, th sorry, this is not a job application. Um, but to but to r devote the same amount of energy that it is devoting to solving problems of of um, uh, the you know well there are so many things self driving cars are. Uh, but but um, all, all sorts of other energy issues and um, the other things that Silicon Valley is looking at at the moment, like universal basic income and you know all these great moonshot technologies and thought processes. But I see very little that's actually designed to create gender equality. So where is the moonshot technology, or where is the great big thinking and the great big investment? in gender equality because gender equality is something that will benefit everyone. So there is, it isn't just a matter of social justice, it's a matter of logic and self-interest. And um, the reason I'm saying that is because I don't really expect business, I expect businesses to be ethical, but I don't expect them to necessarily respond to um, uh, social justice concerns. But this is good business, this is good economics. Uh, it should be happening. So yes, Google X, do your thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, thanks. So I just wanted to ask a bit around um, how much kind of outreach you're doing to, I guess, leverage the women, uh, female members of other political parties. To put this into context, so my mother is women's officer for her local Labour constituency, and she has had such difficulty prizing away the list of female members from all of the other kind of um, officers who are all men. Um, she's really struggling to leverage um, to leverage that. And when I spoke to her about the Women's Equality Party, she wasn't aware that she could be both a Labour Party member and a member um, of your party as well. How much do you kind of look to kind of work together actively um, and like leverage the fact that politics doesn't have to be a monogamous relationship exactly no that's that's a hugely important point um, the answer is we've been working right from the very beginning um, talking very intensively to other parties looking at really inventive ways of working with them Hadler's actually been involved directly in drafting legislation um, on um, she worked with the Lib Dems on drafting legislation to combat revenge pornography, and that's going through now. Uh, where's no, it? okay? It's dead. Okay, <laughs> that's the problem with all these things. It was going through the last time I looked. Um, and uh, on Brexit, we had um, an amendment which was put forward for us by Caroline Lucas of the Greens um, that we. Uh, drafted and that got the most cross-party support of any of the amendments. So that's a more kind of straightforward way of working with the parties, but we're also looking at other ways of collaborating, uh, exploring all of these possibilities. On the membership question, um, we opened our party to members of other parties. Some of the other parties then reacted by, by um, trying to push out some of the people who had who had joined us because they believe they want to enforce monogamy at a time when clearly um, we should all be polyamorous um, but um, the um, we have had really good collaboration from most of the parties anyway so at our first party conference I shared a stage with Sal Brinton who's the president of the Lib Dems with um, Nikki Morgan from the Conservatives and with Amelia Womack from the Greens, the Labour Party didn't 
send anyone. And um, I think that one of the things with Labour is they tend to think they are the party of gender equality. So we have more of a job of work to do. All of the women in Labour know that's not true, yeah. but they're quite conflicted about how to respond to that. I think there are such great women in that party and, and it does and it has done great things for women in the past. So none of this is to speak against any of the achievements of Labour. But um, somebody tweeted during the Labour Party leadership recently that if Labour ran la a race for leader and that was all women, a man would win. And sometimes you feel that that is true. <laughs> we have time for one last question. I won't speak to the irony of letting a man ha have the last word. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, that was great. I mean, one of the, the conflicts or contradictions I have is, you said the equality is about minimising the differences, you know, which I completely agree with. But then, I th it's yeah, it's not about minimising the differences. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, if we say it's about celebrating those differences, we fall into this trap of stereotyping genders. And I think we often say that, oh, the differences are that women are always collaborative and men are always forthright or whatever, which we know is not true. So I, I find it very difficult to balance in my head how do we go about equality not being about making us all the same, and then on the other side of us, not saying that, oh, a woman has to be like this or a man has to be like that. I mean, how do you kind of balance that in your head and how do we communicate that? It's a very good question, and I think one of the reasons that women are often quite defensive and in terms of describing ourselves as nicer and more collaborative than you lot is because you've allowed us so little, I don't mean you personally, but we have been allowed so little uh, ownership of most of our lives or defining ourselves that the bits that we can define for ourselves we get a bit too defensive about sometimes. So the, the myth of, of us being a lot nicer than you, which was exploded for me on about the third ad hoc steering committee that we had where we started arguing and came up with a much better solution. Um, and um, I think having said that, um, it, one happy coincidence is that I deal with a lot of this in the book so when you read the book you'll you'll know but I, but I think it is it is a really important question I mean what we have to do is find ways of of knowing who we are and what we could be if we did not have these stereotypes imposed on us so it is not our business to enforce stereotypes but to encourage and celebrate diversity we are also an intersectional party, so we are a party that understands that being female is, is a huge structural disadvantage that intersects with other kinds of disadvantage and discrimination. So if you are a woman of colour, you're going to be at a far greater disadvantage, for example, than, than me who grew up without that particular thing, but now that I'm getting older, I'm encountering ageism. So, you know, there, there are all these ways that we need to analyze what's going on and understand it but that is to analyze and understand difference is also to be on a way towards also appreciating and celebrating and enabling rather than th this is not about creating some kind of one-size-fits-all solution and it is definitely not about replicating the current order but just with a few women in sitting in glass offices at the top of towers um, but the equalia that I describe in the book, the gender equal world, it is not a perfect world. It isn't a utopia, but the point about it is that it's achievable and it's a lot better than this one. That sounds like a very positive message on which to finish. Uh, so thank you so much. I, we could keep talking for hours and hours and hours, I'm sure, and, and hopefully we will have you back again and we can continue the conversation and continue it on social media and everything else. But uh, for tonight, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, really.